This is another episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC, celebrating 40 plus years on the fringe of show business. Stories, interviews, and comedy sets from the famous and not so famous. Here's your host and MC, Scott Edwards. Ladies and gentlemen, I have such a treat for you today. I, I know I say that every week, but this is one of my oldest friends in the comedy world, a guy that I emulated and helped make me a better MC, a better club owner, and uh, just, I think, one of the funniest guys ever to hit the stage. You probably don't know his name. He's not famous, but to me, he's one of the best in the business. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Ron Kenny. <laughs> well, thank you. God, that's amazing. Well, I got to tell right you. about me helping you become a, 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 a fabulous MC, club owner. The show business has two words. I w- I'm extremely good and knowledgeable about the show and ba- uh, b- the business part on show business. I know nothing. But uh, <laughs> but you were you were good at both, and there's no doubt about that. Well, uh, and I want to make it clear to the audience, because you may hear me slip up once in a while. I always knew him as Ronnie Kenny. He is um, <laughs> my age, so we're a little older now, and he matured and went by Ron the last few decades. But Ron or Ronnie one of the funniest guys ever to hit the stage. So, mm-hmm. so great to have you on the podcast. One of the reasons I do this show is to reconnect with people that I had a chance to work with back in the 80s and 90s. And Ron, when it came to being an MC, being a strong feature act, and then you were a headliner for me, nobody worked the audience like you did. How did you kind of get started in comedy? Well, that, that's you're exactly right about that, and that's why you and I hit it off so well. We were the same type of guy. Let me take you back to how I got started. Uh, I was in junior college, and um, you know, I, I was in a play. I was in a musical one year, and then I was in a play called The Odd Couple. And I thought, and the, the getting laughs thing intrigued me. I was getting laughs because of that show. And this is a true story. Uh, at the end of the semester, they were going to have a, a big uh, uh, dinner thing for for everybody in the um, uh, uh, drama department, the show department, and the guy this guy says to me, uh, "We want you to do a, a Johnny Carson like monologue thing. You were funny. We think you're funny. Why don't you do that?" And I said, "I've always wanted to try that," which is true. And as my uh, mom told my dad, uh, "Ron's been in your office for eight hours today working on something. I don't know what it is." And he all he said to me was. Whatever you're working on, you should consider doing that for a living because we've never seen you work that hard on anything. And they didn't know I was trying to. <laughs> that's true. That's exactly what I said. And he said, uh, uh, "What you know?" And then, anyway, this is true, and this leads to the movie scene in my mind for my life. I went on that. He was introduced, and and I went up, and I. Well, what I did, I got to be honest. I had four minutes of about of material that I wrote, and then I stole about four jokes from Johnny Carson's monologue thinking that no matter what happens, I can get off stage with laughs, stealing some of his material. I have to admit that. And I went on stage and I got no laughs, zero. (laughs) And the thing was, uh, even as I was speaking, I realized it wasn't that the jokes were bad. They didn't even make sense. And then I said, well, at least I got these Johnny Carson jokes to get me off stage. So I did the setup for the first one, and some guy in the audience yelled out the punchline because he'd seen Johnny that night also. Uh. So now I'm totally, I'm totally stunned, not knowing, having a clue what to do my first time on stage introduced as a comedian. And so I told my next Johnny Carson uh, setup, and he yelled out the punchline again, and I know I looked like the proverbial uh, deer stuck in headlights. And I just said, thank you, good night. And I walked out. But, you know, Scott, the main thing I'll never forget, I wasn't the least bit uh, traumatized by that. That was just an experience. And I'll never, here's where the movie starts for me right here. When I said to myself, that's as bad as that can possibly go. I wonder what the other side of that feels like. So and right then and there, I committed yeah. to stand-up comedy. Well, Ronnie, and I started. 
I got to tell you, mm-hmm. so many people talk about uh, our peers in the business that when they got that first big laugh, it was such addictive. It was it was like a drug. They wanted to keep chasing that opportunity to get laughter. And here you're kind of telling you the you're sharing mm-hmm. the opposite. I, I, I mm-hmm. bombed, which everybody bombs, but I bombed yeah. big time. And instead of it. We all did. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of taking away your interest in the industry, it made you want to find the funny. I think Mm -hmm. that's a great story. Yeah. And by the way, another thing, this, I find it a very interesting uh, topic, uh, Scott, because when I've worked with other comics, I says, what was your first time? Like, tell me your first laugh and what, and, and some guys got it together kind of quickly and other people had a, a, you know, just couldn't, were just doing stuff that they didn't even want to talk about like not making sense. So I, anyway, they had these uh, uh, open mic nights all over LA and bars and restaurants. So there's, they're all over the place. And, uh, and it was mostly singers and magicians. Cause what was a comedian back then? You know? Yeah. Uh, there was, so, and I kind of like, there was like three or four of us kind of hanging out together. And I was striking out really, I, uh, Scott, I said, this is, I couldn't get a laugh because I wasn't, <laughs> And then that it, really, and then that magic night happened out in the valley. I went and there, and uh, during the show, they said, "Hey, we got a surprise for you." There's a guy who's really good. Uh, he works uh, USO shows. That, that's how a lot of comedians work USO shows for the military around the world. And this guy, and his, and his name is Skip Stevenson, and we're going to give him 15 minutes instead of five minutes. You know, they gave the comedian uh, five minutes and the singers two songs. So he went on and did 15 minutes of nonstop comedy. Every one of his lines got a huge laugh. I was blown away. I couldn't believe what I just saw. I was stunned. And then when the show was over, hours, a couple hours later, whatever, the guy said, if you want to stick around, Skip Steven wants to work out. What, you know, we're going to go. Uh, he wants to and it reintroduce him. And he did another half hour of killer comedy. And this is one thing I give myself all the credit in the world. I said, I'm not letting that guy leave. And I introduced myself to him and said, I have to talk to you and I have to talk to you alone. And he worked it out. We sat in the booth and I said, I don't know how to get, how to write jokes. I don't know what I'm doing. And, uh, and he asked me a couple of questions like, are you, where are you from? I said, I'm from LA. That's really unique. And he says, well, you got to write some jokes about what it's like being from LA. I, you know, you saw my material about being from Nebraska versus LA. I said, oh, I never thought of that. And then he asked me, what'd your dad do? Now, if you're wondering what my first joke that ever worked for me was, here it comes. I said, well, he teaches criminology at USC right now, but he used to be a cop. And he goes, really? And then I said this line that I always said about my dad that I did. Everyone always laughed off stage, but I didn't realize it was a joke. I said, yeah, he talked like a cop. He never called me Ron. He called me suspect and Skip <laughs> screams. That's a joke. That's a joke. And I was in shock. And then I said, and I didn't realize it was a tagline. And after that, I would always say, and he, uh, he describes me to other people as a male Caucasian youth. And he screamed again. That's a joke. And that's been a joke. I got to admit, I've used in corporates my entire career. And that led us in. We wrote a whole routine right there. It, it, Skip would say, did he have a bullhorn? Were you, did you ever have to take a field sobriety? To, you know, all this. Have you been in a police lineup? And we wrote and wrote and wrote. And from that night on, there's a thing starting. And my life, including you and, and Last Unlimited, was just the timing on everything was perfect. He said, something's going on at a place called the Comedy Store. And, and they have an open mic night. And, and I went up there and I watched a couple Monday nights. And I went on, I practiced this stuff. And talk about luck. And I befriended a guy in line. We were friends until he passed away this way. Mitchell Walters. He was the MC. Oh, yeah. He went on and he said to Mitzi, you got to watch this guy. He, he's my new friend. And we were, and, and Mitzi saw me that night and I didn't do great, but I got laughed at the comedy store. And she said, and she said, you come around, you're part of the group now you're in. Oh man. And, uh, and that's, and, and what you and I have in common is, uh, oh, by the way, do you remember the, fir- you don't remember the first time we ever met, do you? No, I don't. And I do want to make it clear to the audience that you're talking about Mitzi Shore, who ran the, the comedy store. And Mitzi was so powerful in the business that much like Bud Friedman, if you got into her family, into her group, 
you were it was like the mafia you were made so getting you that exactly- getting that mm-hmm. from the the other people uh, from the club getting that acceptance by Mitzi I mean what a huge opportunity Ron uh, but mm-hmm. as far as you working for me I mean I just remember from early on bringing you up and and you just killing but I, no I don't remember how we met well, I remember, and by the way, you are 100% about Mitzi Shore and being in her family. And I, by the way, I've never heard it worded better than you just put on it. But I met you, I remember, because it was so unique. Uh, I was, you know, everyone that knew me, because of Skip Stevenson, I started writing jokes about the fact I was from L.A., but for two years I had to live in Sacramento. My father got a job with the state, and I went to McClatchy High School my junior and senior year. Oh, that's and, right. and I cracked a couple of jokes. And so I'm back down. And one night somebody came up to me and said, Ronnie, uh, there's uh, somebody here from from Sacramento. And I thought they were trying to say there's someone asking about you from Sacramento. I figured it was an old high school friend or a relative. And I said, where's this person? And they pointed and I went over and it was you. And I go, oh, and I remember me. Yeah, you, there was nothing silly about you or goofy or you were just a, a guy you, you was having a comedy club and we hit it off immediately as far as I was concerned and I didn't I didn't say hey you got to do this I didn't like that but and by the way and then you had me up there I'll never forget the first person I worked with on your show and working with you Gary Shandling and that was a what a show that was oh and yeah Scott, you, know, you and Gary would have been a great show Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I, I will. I second that. And uh, that's one thing about cl- it was later on. I learned a couple of things about how important you were to your club. So many places book shows so ridiculously bad. I would go, what are you doing? And I don't remember. You know, some people you can take two people that are great, but the one person's style can't follow the other one real well. You obviously know about that. And I I, I would tell Mitzi when she's booking a, a show at the, at the uh, in when we were in Las Vegas, this gal can't follow him. Have her follow me and put him third, you know, and put the and because we, we had five. And I was good at that. And and you obviously uh, had that going on. I I saw what you were doing, and we were befriended because I got good on stage because Mitzi Shore had me and Argus Hamilton emceeing shows every night at the Comedy Store. Like he would go on at eight and MC and do his 15 minutes and MC from eight to 10. And I would go on 10, do 15 minutes and, and MC from 10 to 12. Or I would go on at eight and he would, and we, and that's how you get good. Any would be comedians, if you want to know how, how to get good and how Scott Edwards got good and powerful on stage, it's all about stage time. And that's how I got good. And that's why I was drawn to Scott. Hey, you're doing, you know, you're doing great. Just it's stage time. And, uh, and you knew about funny announcements and you knew how to ask for people where they're from and, and, and summer stock lines and how to, you know, people dating and, and, uh, married people. And some, it, it was just the Tim Jones said, Ron, you were the master at the weave. You could weave in and out of your material, making people think you're playing off of them. But Scott, Scott, you definitely did it. <laughs> and you gave, in the process, you gave your club something that I didn't realize at the time was so important. But when I started playing clubs all over the country, your club had a personality and it was all triggered by you. You go in there. This, this is a show. A lot of places uh, didn't have uh, they'd have it, it would look like a perfect showroom. Uh, everyone's involved uh, and they'd have a crummy uh they, I remember this one place. People uh, that worked there were, were allowed to turn the sound on and off to screw up the MC, and I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, very and, unprofessional. Like there was no no silliness, no stupid stuff at your club. And by the way, on the other hand, a guy in Omaha, uh, Omaha had a bartender who made the club. I mean, you were in that. He did the opening announcement for the show, and he was like, you know, are you ready to rumble and all that kind of stuff? And there was no chance anybody was going to, you know, everyone, the, the MC had to be strong enough to follow his five-minute intro. And uh, anyway, you got me thinking and going on and on, but that's no. how you got good. It was, no. it was, and we had that in common. It was 
Well, you were you were the master, but I want to touch on a couple quick things for those either looking for reference in Sacramento, one of the oldest high schools in the country, but in one of the oldest in Sacramento is McClatchy High School. It's in South Sacramento. Going to McClatchy did give us a connection. And then to just mention the name Argus Hamilton, for those listening that are in the industry, everybody knew how important and how viable a comic Argus Hamilton was at the comedy store because once you were a trusted MC, Mitzi gave you that power of who got on stage, how much time you got, and where it was going to go. And Ron, you had that power, and sharing that with Argus was amazing. And what an incredible opportunity for you as a career. At what point did you turn pro? Do you remember the first time you got paid? Yes, I do. Uh, and by the way, uh, before we get to when Mitzi, let me tell you how, when you're in the family, let me tell you how well I had it made. Uh, she opened a club in San Diego, and that's that was a, just a, almost what we stayed in her condo down there. it would be three or four comics in two condos on the beach, and we got paid for that. That was the only money we were making, and, and you're not living off of that. you know. But anyway... So when people, comedy clubs saw that, that triggered a lot of comedy clubs around the country. And in Newport Beach, this guy knew, uh, he said, Ron, can you be my house MC? I'll pay you. And for some strange reason, I said to Mitzi, I told her what this guy said. And she said, how many nights would you work? I said, six nights a week, you know, two shows Friday, two for Saturday. And, I get, and she said, Ron, do it. And I only want you to take a week off when I send you to San Diego. I had the I had it so made because I was in her inner sanctum. And that sounds strange, but she let me work there for a year. And when she calls, Ron, you're going to La Jolla next week. I had to tell the boss I'm getting somebody to cover for me. And uh, yeah, but, see, uh, but anyway, I, that's a shocking story uh, to hear and an amazing one, because for those that were in the know, Mitzi was not very sharing. Uh, when she latched on to a talent, it was unlike right. her. You know, there was times that if you played the improv, you couldn't play the store and vice versa. Yeah. And mm-hmm. for her to be that giving. Now, was that club the Comedy Magic Club? Which club were you emceeing at? No, it, no, it wasn't the Comedy Magic Club. That's her most big. Well, we'll I forget. Just, we'll just call it the last laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and the thing was, and I can go deep, but I don't want to get too personal. But what you said is right. When you were in her, and by the way, uh, the per, they called me one time. I think it was in 1979. Uh, Ron, we're opening, oh, the same group. They're opening up a comedy club in Houston. We want you to come. We're going to fly you down and give you a 70, 750 a week, a hotel room, and you'll work the club. And then uh, I told Mitzi about that, and she said, go. And then I ended up staying down there for six weeks wow. doing all these colleges. All, uh, comedy was opening up. And here's the thing, and if it sounds like I'm bragging. I'm, no, I'm just pure luck. Mitzi said, Ronnie, you go do what you're going to do, and whenever you come, when you come back here, you're going to be at the same level you always were. That's amazing. And I would be gone for like two or three weeks and then come back, and I would still get like, five, six nights a week. Cause I always MC and take the MCs, which I loved. That just was like, you know, with you, you, you still go on stage, not just once you go back up and back up again and make some funny announcements and do some more jokes. So it, well, that's how again, I, it leads to that stage time that whether you're an MC or an actual paid act doing a set time, uh, mm-hmm. I think at MC there's been said a few times that I may have had more stage time than some of your biggest names because I was on stage every night, all night. And I I, think being an MC is a great learning position. I I only disagree with one thing you said. It is the learning condition. I honestly believe that, Scott. That's how you got, if nothing else, you were good and you were strong. I'm strong. I, I, you know, I don't care about winning arguments off stage or being messed with. But when I'm on stage, I'm the man. And I got it from being, you handled every kind of situation that can happen in a showroom. So did I. And that, and that makes us, uh, and the only way to get that good is, is to be that much uh, stage time. It's experience, and the problem, right? Uh, yeah. Stage experience, you know? And, uh, 
Well, you did Shout end up, you started off with me as an MC opening act that didn't last very long. You were a feature act for a, a few bigger names like Gary Shandling, but you were so damn good. You did become a headliner mm-hmm. for me. And, and, uh, and that's because a lot of comics couldn't follow you because you were so funny. Do you remember any, uh, good stories from the days at Laughs Unlimited? Well, I love uh, some of the relationships. I've, I've been thinking a lot about Tim Jones. Oh, because yeah. I know you guys were so close. Uh, he he really, yeah, everybody loved him. And and we worked up there a lot, and we drove up together a couple of times, and I liked that. Can I tell you, uh, you know, in my uh, act, I had a, a routine about my mom. We would do one show a year at her church in Lake Arrowhead. I don't know if you remember that, but it's a true story. It went on for years. And I had a lot of major comic and, and I was like you. I was like the house MC. Everybody knew me, so I would just each each year I would MC the show, crack jokes about the minister. The crowd would go crazy. It was right in the main chapel and all that. Well, one year I had Tim, a girl in the middle, and Tim closed that show, and uh, he closed with the most beautiful statement you ever heard in your life. I had no idea where it was going. He said, "Ladies and gentlemen, it's been my opportunity to see why Ron brags about his mom and cracks jokes about his dad. Most wonderful people I've ever met." And God bless him. And it was an honor to meet you. And I would like to take this opportunity now to, to meet for you to meet my parents who come to each one of my shows. And he's a black comedian, of course. And he went down in the front row and he made this white couple stand up and they all hugged each other and they held each other and rocked around. And it was like this. It was the biggest <laughs> laugh in the, in the history of that church. They Everyone always said that was the biggest laugh. Well, Tim yeah, you know, well, Jones, for those listening, uh, sadly has passed on, but he was one yeah. of the, I've got some great video of him on my network site. If you get a chance, check it out. But Tim Jones was one of those guys that always did well with the crowd, much like you, Ron. In fact, I believe I co-headlined you guys uh, several times because you work so well together and Correct. very, very uh, funny and clean, you know, he could be clean and edgy, but uh, depending mm-hmm. on what you wanted, he could do it. A uh, great guy to bring up, and I'm glad that you mentioned his name. Now, you did a lot of road work. You t- already talked about going to Texas and different clubs. Any nightmare mm-hmm. road stories? Yeah, I got one. Can I tell you one more thing about Tim? Sure. He was so, and another thing about uh, Last Unlimited in Sacramento. Remember, I went to high school there, and I had a lot of connections there. And all of my friends and relatives that I happen to have in Sacramento would come to your place a lot. And one time, one of the funniest things uh, we did, uh, six of my friends were cops. Uh, four were sheriff's deputies. One was the police department. You were, you were out of town that night, Scott. I remember vividly. And nothing got out of line, but it was me and uh, Tim Jones. He was in the middle on that show and a co-headline that I was going on last. And my friends showed up. They no one would have known, but the six cops were drunk, and they don't get they don't act stupid in public like most drunks. But they were drunk. Only I knew it. And I was smart enough to wait towards the end of the show. I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, I like to uh, introduce tonight some friends. Proud to say, friends of mine, Sacramento's finest. They played in the Pig Bowl. And let's give a big round of applause." And I introduced them one by one from the sheriff's department, the police department. And they were couldn't believe, and the crowd's applauding like this and all that. And Tim, I can hear him screaming in the back because he knew they were drunk. And then all of a sudden, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you another honest thing about them right now. They're off duty, and they're all drunk. Well, that got a big <laughs> laugh. It got a big laugh, and everyone thought I was joking. I said, folks, I'm not joking. They know how to handle it, but they are drunk, and they are pounding on the table. They are laughing so hard, and they're doing everything not to be seen. And I forget who was your manager, but I said, bring up the house lights. I said, Tim, go over there and make one of those guys take the field sobriety test. And he took one guy, because they all loved Tim, and took him over and he put his hands on your wall. Anyway, it was. Oh, man, I'm sorry I missed that. That sounds like one of those special moments. (laughs) You know, one thing, you were were all comedian, and and, and I'm not sure if I would have done that if you were there, but or I would have, I don't know. No, you were. So great to work, but that's another thing you had. There was never any any BS in the showroom that I saw in so many comedy clubs uh, around the country. Uh, let me let me tell you how bad it got. And club owners get in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, where I worked a lot. 
they and by the way, as you're saying about uh, another reason I worked all the time, I'll take any spot on a show, you know, like if you, uh, you know, I'd love to go first or whatever it happens to be. So what they would do when they were having a major star from television, you know, that guy, I forget names, with the puppets, uh, last name starts with a D. He's a major star, and he was coming in to, to headline the weekend for big money, and he, he they would have me headline Tuesday through Thursday, and then I said, let me just MC myself. I'll bring myself up, and I'll do, what do you want, 25, 30? Here's the thing. In that club, they used to have comedians go on in front of these stars that were filthy and unfunny. And the audience would sit. These are people that just paid big money to see those major stuff. And they would sit with their hands over their ears. I've never seen. You think you've seen everything, Scott? I, this is. And people say that's what happens all the time. So when they started having me in front of these people, the compliments to the. Oh, and people would come up to me. No one said I was better than the headliner. said, you were unbelievable. We're not used to having somebody hysterically funny in front of. So that's another reason I worked out. They would call me, they'd get my schedule. We want you to fly in and open MC through Thursday and do, and that became a thing. Well, you were so good at working an audience. You had a baseline of yeah. comedy that you had written, but you could work a crowd right. like nobody. And so mm -hmm. whether you were opening, featuring or headlining, or just being the master of ceremonies, Ron Kenny had the talent to fill any spot and they were smart right. to let you do that. And I'm glad that the audience, much like my audiences, always appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely had that, that going on. You did, um, you did have a different style because you were so quick minded and good on stage. Was there mm -hmm. anybody in the industry you looked up to or did, that you saw that maybe you emulated? I ended up being later on being best friends with Buddy Hackett. That's a completely amazingly different story. I befriended Don Rickles and I got to talk to him a lot. You know, some of the stuff that he says is I've even said is not funny, but it's so funny because it's him and his timing. And who did I emulate? I, I emulated, uh, well, uh, Bob say, uh, well, Letterman Leno, who I, I was the MC the night that Leno always says, I'll never forget the first time I saw David Letterman. He was on stage. I never met him. And I remember the first line he said and the first joke he told where Leno said, he's got it. Both of those guys helped me immensely. And I was one thing about, I told you when Mitzi opened that, that show uh, at club in San Diego, I worked with uh, Robin Williams there probably 30, 40 times. Wow. For some reason. And, and if he was alive right now, whenever he saw me, he would do an impression. He go, Ronnie, I want you to, to go to La Jolla next week and take Robin. We also work with Robin. And uh, <laughs> he would do Mitzi. And I got, yeah, the, that that was how Mitzi talked. You know, get Scott. You were from Sacramento. We couldn't go there. You know, she, she would just whine like that all the time. But anyway, uh, one of my favorite things he got me out of two uh, traffic tickets speeding tickets, driving back. When we were driving back, we'd, we'd do one week. And we're, after the show, we're driving back to L.A. Sunday night after the show. And I got pulled over to get a, a speeding ticket. And I go, well, here comes a speeding ticket. No doubt about that. And uh, and this is before he was famous. The first one, highway patrolman comes around to his side of the car. And before the guy can ask me for my license and registration, Robin goes into talking a mile a minute in some foreign language that doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> nonstop, will not stop. And the guy thought we're foreigners. And I have my hand over my nose and mouth to try. And the tears of laughter are coming over my ear. He could see me crying. And we assume he thought that we were from a foreign country where the police kill people. <laughs> and uh, he finally... He finally just said, slow down, slow down. And he walked back to his car and he took off. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. Cause... Yeah. And now the second one, same exact thing. This is after he made it. He was on Mork and Mindy, you know, major show. The whole country is going crazy over Mork and Mindy. So the highway patrol, I say, here, I'm getting a speeding ticket, comes around to that side. And there's Robin. And Robin, before the guy can speak, Robin does that thing with his hand and goes, Nanu, Nanu. 
which is, you know, his line on Mark right. and Lindy. And it just stunned the highway patrolman. He stared at him for the longest time and said, you're Mark and Mindy. And he goes, no, I'm just Mark. And and then he said, let's call in. And he did all these race. Of course, that was right. <laughs> you know, he, does, he can do anything. And he is making this guy just go crazy. He goes on and does an entire routine for this guy. The guy finally looked at me and said, do you remember why I pulled you over? Cause I don't. <laughs> and I said, I think you wanted to meet Robin Williams. He oh, said, okay, just funny. slow down. And that's two mm. Robin Williams stories. Well, that's hilarious. And and what, that was one of my questions that I wanted to bring up because you are historically one of the best MC comics, a crowd working comic. In mm-hmm. fact, I, I want to touch on real quick, by the way, for our audience, getting a chance to work with Don Rickles and Buddy Hackett, two of the masters of the stage when it came to comedy and both, but especially Don Rickles, they could work a crowd to tears Mm -hmm. with laughter. And even though both those guys would might challenge in today's woke audience back in the day, nobody could touch them when it came to comedy. So for you getting a chance to work with them and learn from them was such a Mm -hmm. gift but I was going to say, with you've had this great history of opening up, and you've already mentioned those two guys and Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. Were there any celebrities you worked with where you were kind of starstruck? Uh, well, I I opened for a lot of celebrities. Uh, that's another thing. When I, Missy Shore opened up in the Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas, you came by there once. I remember that. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, it was a. We were in the main showroom, and she had me work there more than anybody else. She just told me because and we were making great money, and uh, because I could, uh, you know, handle the show. I was made for Las Vegas. Oh, my yeah. favorite review. Here's my favorite. Then I'm going to tell you what I was no good at. But my favorite review was uh, Ronnie Kenny knows Las Vegas audiences. He knows that they don't want dirty, but Las Vegas audiences love sexual innuendo. Ronnie is the master of sexual innuendo. They don't want dirt, but everyone's got sex on their mind in, in Las Vegas. And I just uh, had a, uh, I just owned Las Vegas. Now at the same time, if you remember colleges were up and there was a kind of a college market and I dabbled in that. And that's where I, I had the worst batting average. You, you won't even believe this, Scott. I almost, it, it was the worst imaginable. And, and whenever I worked with somebody, with, oh, this one guy, he was really soft. Uh, and he wasn't very good. I mean, he was good, but I, but he was the master at the colleges. And I said, I'm just interested. I work all the time anyway, but why don't I fit in colleges? I like to talk about partying and alcohol and gigs. And, and he said, I think because you look like everything they hate. You look like their mom. Their, you, know, you look like their dad. You Your look mom. like a cop. And everyone's <laughs> always looked like a cop. And I went, that's it. You know, I mean. And, and you look like uh, the principal and you look like the security. And, you and, have an and authoritative that, look, right. So, yeah, and, and, and Scott, to prove the point, I was the worst at that. I really don't think I saw anybody with And I was the best at corporates because it's all about looks. When I put on a suit and tie, more than one person told me, you do so well in corporates because you look like us and you're not intimidating. We like you as you hit the stage. And that didn't bother me, but just telling you the truth, I I set records of working the most in Las Vegas. Uh, I I never knew it, but they, you know, people keep track of such things. But uh, colleges, that I never needed it. Uh, but then the corporates, when the comedy club circuit started to fade, I was into corporates. Well, I I think there's a real um, obvious reason that you succeeded so well. I'm, I am a little stunned by the college thing because your material really would have worked for them, but I hadn't realized the look aspect. But when it comes to corporate, your material is so good at connecting with an audience and interacting with an audience Mm -hmm. that they love that. And I, I could see easily how you would really uh, do mm-hmm. well in that scenario. And you bring up a good point. Clubs started fading. Corporate work was a good way to go. Did you ever end mm-hmm. up doing, uh, and you did a lot of casinos in Vegas. Were you doing cruises at all? Cruise ships at all? I ended up doing cruises. Uh, that was the last place of uh, real interest for me because everyone always said, 
cruise, you were made for cruise ships. You're perfect for cruise ships. I heard that for years, but I didn't need it. One thing I want to get clear, and I love the way you, you said my material, you, you and I are so much alike, uh, Scott, because uh, my material I thought was so perfect for the colleges, but it was the looks, but the corporate thing. And the same, main thing about them is you got to know a little bit about who they are, what their group is and never be, and don't ever be offensive, but, you know, I know you're a CEO and I know that, you know, da, da, da. I, I, remember, I heard you had a golf tournament recently and it's not all about my material, but it's how well I could weave it in between them. Right. right. I had to talk Engaging about them. Engaging with them. Yeah. You engaged yeah, with those audiences. Impressive. Well said. That's the whole point. And if you thought you were going to go up and just do your straight act, uh, your corporates were difficult. They paid well, but they were difficult. And sometimes the conditions, uh, Scott, I don't know how much you know about, were just awful. I remember I was doing this, forget where, all over the country I'd do them. And this one corporation, major money, I mean, big, and I, and uh, the CEO met me at the door of the country club I was performing at, and I'm wearing it. I love to wear a tuxedo. I think they're funny. I like that. And I showed up, and he said, R Ronnie, we're, we're so excited about having you, and, and uh, and then he showed me where everybody was dining, and he said to me, where do you want to stand? You know, <laughs> there, there, there's no microphone. There's no podium. There's no lighting. Oh, he just geez. Thought, you know, and, Scott, it goes on into nightmares, corporate nightmares. It, it is just so brutal. I could go on for an hour, but it's not a very positive thing. Can I tell you, Drew Carey has a great story about corporates. And many people that did them, got to be honest with you, each one of them paid about the same as one week in a comedy club. If you get, you know, so, and I, I hate to use the term, but I did it just for the money. Uh, but I would go and, uh, but anyway, Drew told me about one. He just got confirmed that he was going to get that TV series. He, he got his first TV series. It was in the, signed the contract and his manager and all that stuff. So, and, and he was doing Carson all the time. And he got one of those, which I never got one anywhere near that big, a $50,000 corporate gig in Las Vegas. And he went and he met the CEO and all that kind of stuff. And he was going to do, and he hated corporates. most. And anyway, he went on and it started like at two o'clock one afternoon in the main showroom, I think of Caesars or something that good. And he went up and he cracked a couple of jokes about the co corporation and and the CEO or something, and which were okay because I made him tell me exactly what the wording was. Did you did you make a mistake or anything? All of a sudden, and now the CEO for some reason he's drunk. I mean, he's seriously drunk. He runs on stage. He's wrestling the microphone away from uh, Drew Carey, and he's going, "Nobody makes fun of my corporate that kind of thing." Oh wow! And, uh, yeah, and Drew, uh, Drew said he handed the, the thing to him, and walked off the stage. And as he walked, he he said he knew he was leaving behind fifty thousand dollars because he was walking into some serious, serious, serious money. And but he but he said I'm walking away from fifty thousand dollars, but I don't care because I'll never have to do another corporate again in my career. Well, and Scott, I'm not one to get jealous, but I told him I am jealous of that statement. <laughs> you know, corporates are all about the money. I got to admit, if, if I got a phone call tomorrow and the money was there, okay, I'll give it a couple. It, it could be a nightmare, and, and they can. But. Well, it's just, it's sad, and in, in I thought about hanging a shingle as, as a corporate comedy producer or show producer. Uh, mm -hmm. I do a lot of fundraisers and stuff in my community, but I've heard so many nightmare stories where then, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah. Comics are getting paid anywhere from 2000 to, like you said, 10 or 20,000 for one show in front of mm -hmm. a certain corporate group. And yet they put no thought into the staging, all the things that make Fact. it work, the lighting, the Fact. sound. It's just crazy Scott, that these you got companies it all. are you, you so got it nailed. off. You, you, they have no concept of that. You, you you just nailed it. You know exactly what. It's just a nightmare. Yeah. Going well, on for hours. I, I I mean, it's I I suppose uh, Drew Carey had a situation you and I would never be aware <laughs> able to do. But you kind of sidestepped a question. You have worked with so many large groups and celebrities. Was there anybody 
that really kind of took your breath away? You were just extra excited about? Gosh, you know, I've worked with so many. The Righteous Brothers, seeing them live, you know, uh, uh, is that what we're talking about? Or uh, Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I've interviewed Tom Dreesen, who toured with Frank Sinatra, and I just oh, interviewed yeah. uh-huh. uh, uh, David, who used to tour with uh, uh, a few different celebrity-type comics. And I, I just was wondering, because you were such a pro, and Mitzi put so much faith in you as, as an opening act, especially mm-hmm. in Vegas, if you were thrown into a situation where, yeah, I know I could handle and manage this audience and get their attention for the mm-hmm. star, but mm-hmm. I'm kind of excited to be on the same stage with, I don't know, whomever. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one, Lou Rawls, I was opening for him at the Golden Nugget. That was a classic hotel uh, started by Frank Sinatra and the top guy out there. I forget his name, right? And, I, and the showroom, it's a showroom that's perfect uh, for sound because the, because the uh, ceiling in the audience is very low. And one night I earned my, I, my stock, they loved me uh, because they used me all the time. You know, no one ever said I was the best, but they said I would just, by batting average, I always delivered. Consistent. I never. Yeah. I would say consistent. that you're always consistent and persistent. Yeah. You always get it done. Yeah. And one night the place is packed and the sound goes out before the show starts. And we're backstage, and I'm listening to all this, and uh, they go, "My and Lou Rawls comes out, what's happening, what are we going to do, the band's going to wait to play, and the sound's gone, you know, the lights are on and all that, and I and I looked at this, and I, I knew the showroom, and I said, my stock went down, I said, if you want to, I'll walk out right now and and do this show until the sound comes on, because I know I can be heard in this showroom. Now, at the Caesars Palace, I would have never done that because their ceiling's so high. It's not a great place for comedians. But And my stock went way up. I mean, they they, they talked about that. But Ron volunteered, and, and I did it right in front of Lou Rawls. And he says, you got balls, my boy. And uh, <laughs> Well, that's awesome. But and, uh, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, you took your knowledge of that room and of the acoustics knowing that um all comics have to have a voice yeah Mm -hmm. that you were willing to to do that for uh lou rawls is amazing uh and getting a chance to entertain both in in la hollywood around the country in vegas uh Mm -hmm. tahoe and reno you've really been everywhere was there any gigs that you personally felt like uh you rocked it Were, were you i mean you were always good in sacramento and you were a regular at the store, but was there a particular show or th- location that really seemed to fit the uh, Ron Kenny material? I have no problem telling you this. I owned Las Vegas. I ain't saying, I, you know, I, I, I just, I, I never had a bad, I felt, I felt at home. I just, I was perfect for Las Vegas. Now, like, <laughs> Like colleges, no, you know, uh, Carrot Top was the greatest of that. Uh, or I would go in some comedy clubs. Uh, I, I always felt strong in Sacramento. There were some places around the country I just never felt right, particularly. Well, doing but, well, uh, yeah, Las doing Vegas, well in Vegas. Uh, yeah, I mean, George yeah. Wallace had a great career there. Amazing Jonathan uh-huh. had an amazing career there. Yeah, mm-hmm. and being able to to put Vegas on your resume as one of your key oh, locations mm-hmm. is is uh, a real tribute to your success ron thank you yeah no i feel and scott let me tell you one thing about me half of it will start bragging but the other one i loved what you said ron works constantly uh, he's not famous you know or however you were it's all true everyone thought when i was first hanging out at the comedy store missy shore and jimmy walker and everybody thought i'm definitely going to be on a sitcom not have my own show but like the second or third lead male lead or something like that but i never you know and when i got to work at that comedy club in in newport beach and i never got over the fact that i was making a living performing stand-up comedy and the thing is i'm one of the only guys i know i never had the bar i've never had any financial concerns in my career that's unusual ron uh, that's unusual and that's it sounds like i'm bragging but that is a fact and Scott, that probably worked against me because a very good friend of mine, Andrew Clay, before he became Dice Clay, he, he'll tell anybody in any interview, Ronnie, 
we lived in the, uh, in Mitzi's, uh, one of her mansions. I broke up with a girlfriend. I moved in there and he and I had our own floors in this mansion. He said, Ronnie, come off the road. We'd go to the market. He'd buy the, I'd buy, pick out the food. He'd pay for it and I'd go cook it. And that's how we see. He stayed in LA working on his career where I was out making the money. <laughs> and that's what I, you know, and I, and I, I made a living. I, I, it, I was very proud of the fact that I always made a living. I mean, I didn't have a bad month, you know, comedy clubs closed. I was never wanting, and I never had an outside job. And I'm very proud of that. But well, I also have to admit to myself that it might have cost me becoming famous, you know, because uh, I didn't go to the interviews. And, and Jimmy Walker was on me hard to go. I'll, I'll set this up for you. Do this, do that. And I actually uh, didn't pursue that. Well, uh, I, you know, the thing is, is that you love stand up. You were able to, as yeah. you said, make a living and survive all those years. And there's there's just mm -hmm. a handful of comics that aren't famous, but are professional comics. You know, Tim Bedore, um, Steve Bruner, there's a few of them out there that made a, a whole lifelong career out of doing comedy, mm -hmm. never got famous, but did what they enjoyed doing. And, and you have to take uh, yeah. pride, as you said, in, in that success. I certainly would. Now, I know that you're semi-retired. We're, we're both of an age that there's no reason to go out and have to prove ourselves or anything. But are there any projects coming up in 23 or 24 that you're excited about? Well, I have projects if I wanted them. And um, uh, I, uh, I'll tell you in a second why I really don't pursue uh, them. Um, I think, well, you met the reason I'm working with, uh, that special. How, how do you well, describe Dylan? Well, let's just uh, say to the audience that we all make choices in our life. And instead of pursuing your show business life and career, you had the opportunity to meet a, a special needs man named Dylan. And you two have bonded in such a way that mm -hmm. your, your joy in life now is not necessarily the stage but the joy that you get from hanging out and helping Dylan, who's a challenged adult, get through mm -hmm. life. And I think that that's very admirable. Well, Scott, you sure are good at uh, describing things because I, I made it, you got to meet him over the phone and it was, it was just phenomenal. I, you see, his father was in show, but part time comedian. He wrote and produced uh, a lot of stuff for television and he voted in the Oscars and he would take me to. When he wasn't taking his wife, he'd take take me to see movies that are nominated, so I get to go to studios and all that. And uh, he got cancer and passed away. And it was uh, uh, Dylan still talks about his best friend uh, dying. And uh, so I was one of their many friends. And uh, uh, long story short, I got to started hanging out with him so much. He and his mom and I became friends. We went to Dodger Stadium together a lot. She's a season ticket holder. And we just slowly became friends. And uh, one day she said there was a boy working with him full time. Ron, you're always with him anyway. Why don't you just go to work? You know, I had to, like, take a test for this uh, nonprofit people who work with that, those types of kids, or those kinds of people. And so I did that just to take, you know, first aid and all that. And, but I can be gone whenever I want to. And I was still playing Vegas and, and I would be gone a week and that was fine. And I was on cruise ships and one day on the cruise ships go, I got it made here. I probably without meeting him would have spent the rest of my life on a high dollar cruise ship. I just had it made beyond all comprehension. And uh, I want to tell you something. You know what one of my favorite things is? Uh, on this air, this line, if we were way out in the ocean, they would say, did you want your salary in check or cash? If they <laughs> ask you that, that means that you're not in America and they give you the, the money under the table. If I'm like, gee, I'm admitting on a podcast that I cheated on. I didn't pay tax on that money, <laughs> but no, I, anyway, well, I had it made, but then I made a decision. I, I just want to be with him. And, uh, Denny Johnston, uh, an old famous comedian, He's retired, but he has comedy shows in Palm Springs for seniors, and they're they're great get-togethers because he knows how to put the lighting up correctly, the sound up correctly. So I'll still still do one of those. And if somebody called me for a corporate, I'd go, "All right, well, tell me where it is." Is you know, I'm I might consider stuff, but it's got to be. 
Well, you know, I got to hear from somebody who knows like you, other than I really don't have much interest anymore. Well, I, I think that uh, you're, you're beating around the bush, but I think that the bottom line to the story is, is that you could keep doing comedy. You've had many, many decades of success doing it, and those opportunities are still out there once in a while. But you have found such enrichment in your life by spending mm-hmm. time with Dylan and helping him with his needs and, you know, part caretaker, part best friend. And um, I did get a chance to talk to Dylan. He is... Uh, a unique and very special young man. And I think that uh, you're a gift to him mm-hmm. as much as he's a gift to you. And Ron, you, I think that that is it. such a blessing. Mm-hmm. You nailed it. You worded it exactly perfect. And uh, let me tell you uh, one last thing before, uh, about, you remember the, the book that I wrote and I'd sell it after my shows at your place and wherever I was uh, called uh, the comics open. It was a, 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 a book. Oh yeah, people and, uh, should look it up on Amazon. The comics open. It was a good write, good read. Yeah, it was a good. I like the way you said a good read. That's all it was. And most people said I read that in two sittings. And Doc and Buddy Hackett wrote me a great thing. And uh, uh, anyway, I I sold the movie rights to it on two different occasions. But the, out of that book came a line, Scott, that I want to leave you with, and I want to ask you a question. It because people always ask, why did you become a comedian? What drove you? What was it? And I never really knew. You were a quarterback at McClatchy High School. Is it being a quarterback on stage? I said, that's an interesting thing. And I, th- I thought over the years, but then I wrote this line. And it goes like this. In stand-up comedy, when you're on stage performing stand-up comedy, you can experience every single emotion that there is except boredom. Boredom does not exist on stage for a stand-up comedian. And that's when it dawned on me. I'd even verbalize to myself, I couldn't, I, I'm not putting down anybody that works in an office or drives it. I'm not putting down anybody. But whatever boredom is for you, I, I just didn't want a life with any boredom in it. And that's what I knew. That's why. Why would I have gone through that horror and terror of going to uh, open mic nights around Los Angeles and bombing all over town until I met Skip Stevenson, you know? And, uh, but that's uh, and I've uh, been to the mountaintop. I've been and I've felt embarrassment beyond all comprehension and everything in, in between. And Scott, my last thing I want to do is ask you a question: Has there been any boredom in your career? And I'm not talking anger because you've had anger and I've had anger. I'm talking boredom. I, I'm betting money that there was no boredom in your career at the last unlimited. No, were you on stage as an <laughs> entrepreneur and as a uh, person on the fringe of show business. Um, I always made a point of enjoying life. It wasn't about the money. It was about uh, it, just being thrilled to be living each and every day. But I think that you put it so well, ladies and gentlemen, you never want to be bored in your life. Good job, Ron. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thanks for uh, saving that to the end. Uh, I wish you uh, continued joy with Dylan. I know the two of you will spend many, many uh, moments of joy for each other <laughs> together. And I hope that uh, comedically, maybe there's a chance we'll get a chance to work together again. Sure. But uh, getting the opportunity to chat with one of my oldest friends in the business, Ronnie Kenny, has been such a thrill. Thank you so much, sir. Hey, thank you, Scott. Enjoyed it as much as you did. Ladies and gentlemen, like all of our shows, we're going to add a little bit of Ron's stand-up comedy at the end of this interview, so stay tuned. Ron, take care, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Good to see you. I was excited about doing this. I think I got too excited today. I did a uh, sit-up. Have you tried one of those lately? <laughs> I got real lightheaded. I stopped that immediately, boy. I... I got up, grabbed a beer and a cigarette, and laid back down again. I'm <laughs> not an exercise guy. You are what you eat. What's that supposed to mean? Do I look deep fried, do you people? <laughs> <laughs> got to get new friends. My friends are always bragging about their exercise. They're always going, hey, Ronnie, I ran five miles today. That's great. I own a car. <laughs> I drove 40 miles with a beer between my legs, all right? <laughs> My 
my buddies drink whiskey. There's a, I don't know if whiskey drinkers are smarter than beer drinkers, but they, they do think fast. They come out of uh, get great excuses, get out of trouble. It's like a cop pulls over a whiskey drinker. Do you know you're speeding? I caught you going 85 there on the radar. That's impossible, sir. This is a stealth car. I bought it from the Air Force. You can't see it on the radar. <laughs> Sorry to bother you. Go ahead there. <laughs> the same cop pulls over a beer drinker. Do you know you were speeding? Uh, of course I was speeding. I'm out of beer. <laughs> see, all these cans are empty in the back. <laughs> Cops are serious anymore. Cops ask dumb questions, or I don't know what the right answer is. I got pulled over recently. Cop says to me, you always drive that fast? <laughs> uh, yes, sir, I do. <laughs> I'm glad you finally stopped me. I was getting tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it? Did you know you were weaving? I said, yeah, but I thought I was doing darn well. For somebody who's as much to drink as I have. And, uh... <laughs> that last one's the wrong answer. <laughs> there's nothing funny about drunk driving. We all agree with that. But there's a law that goes too far. It's in every state in the union. Did you know this? You can now be arrested for drunk driving on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, that just amazes me. Was that a major problem in this country? <laughs> Guys are selling crack, shooting newsies. We can't get drunk and go for a bike ride. <laughs> Can't wait to see these commercials. Think before you touch that kickstand. <laughs> if you've been drinking, don't get behind those handlebars, mister. <laughs> friends don't let friends pedal drunk. Yeah. <laughs> what happens? You're too drunk to get home. You call a toll-free number. A guy comes out on a bicycle built for two. All right, idiot, get on the bike. Huh? <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. For information on the show, merchandise, and our sponsors, or to send comments to Scott, visit our website at www.standupyourhostandmc.com. Look for more episodes soon and enjoy the world of stand-up comedy. Visit a comedy showroom near you.